So here is the third and final part of our lecture on Egypt and Nubia. And in this, I want to focus on the nature of the language and the changes in language that happened in Egypt and how this, um, the, mystery, the mystery of the hieroglyphs and how this impacts our understanding of the history of Egypt. To begin with, the word hieroglyph is not the word that the ancient Egyptians used themselves for this language, this written language of theirs. They actually called it Medunek. And it's interesting to think, why do we call this hieroglyphs? And, and almost never heard the word Medunek. Hieroglyphs is actually the Greek word that they used to describe the, uh, what these were. And this is due to the historic fact that the late uh, the Egyptians were in the last dynasties, they were overthrown and ruled by the Greeks. And then in turn, the Romans lost a lot of their heritage during this time because neither the Greeks nor the Romans um, really spent any time trying to figure out how to read hieroglyphs. It was a kind of priestly language that did not interest them. And so we lost a lot of information during this time because they described things as much as they were interested in them, but they hardly took any interest in uh, making sense of the ancient past of the Greeks. So the concept of writing is quite ancient in Egypt. We know that the first evidence goes back to about 2925 BCE. And the concept of writing, there are some interesting indigenous signs and symbols that have been found, early writing systems that may have been the initial basis in Egypt. But it's likely the idea of a kind of monumental language was actually borrowed by the Sumerians, who have been using cuneiform and other related kinds of picture writing for early on, and then sort of adapted sounds and eventually evolved into, you know, our modern alphabet today. The system of writing was very conservative. Like the artwork in Egypt, it was a way in which they gained control over the meanings of their lives and how they communicated them to the people and the way they believed they were really communicating back to the ancestors. So maintaining a very consistent language was a big part of the way in which it was structured. And so all the way until about the 4th century AD, when it was finally supplanted by an early version of Coptic. So in this, there were about 700 signs that were used for about 2,000 years. By the 5th century BCE, Demotic script was used as sort of the business and early language. And it was sort of one of these you know, ways in which simpler, more language, you know, with need to everyday kind of language began to sort of undermine the need to use this sort of more archaic form of hieroglyphs. So let's look at the sort of history of language in ancient Egypt. And you can see the early writing began as official monumental texts, which slowly over the centuries evolved into what's called Old Egyptian. And Old Egyptian sort of expanded into sort of religious texts. And toward the end of the Old Kingdom, we have this, this sort of interface with this new Middle Egyptian emerged, originally sort of as everyday texts, a kind of everyday common language, which then slowly shifted into official monumental texts and then into religious texts and into literary texts. You see this kind of progression as a, a kind of writing begins as something as everyday writing and then slowly starts to impact other parts of official as it becomes more and more sort of established, moving into now the new kingdom here. Now into the late new middle kingdom, we have then new Egyptian, neo-middle Egyptian, archaic demotic, again, beginning as sort of everyday texts and then eventually Demotic sort of taking over and 
becoming the language until it is completely supplanted by Coptic, which becomes the when the Byzantine emperors come in. So the, the Ptolemaic period was this period when the Greeks came in and Ptolemy, who was, uh, took over from Alexander the Great, uh, really rules over uh, Egypt during this time. And in this very key period of transformation of, from you know, self-rule to being uh, part of a, a larger empire, a very unique document was created and carved in stone. This is the, what's now called the Rosetta Stone. And its history is really very important because it not only was sort of a key pivotal moment in that transformation from Neo-Middle Egyptian to Demotic, it was a part of the last of kind of connecting the legacy of Egyptian, and it provided a tool to translate what was happened for many, many, many centuries before. So the Rosetta Stone, what is the Rosetta Stone. It begins when Alexander the Great invaded Egypt in 332 BCE, and Alexander the Great dies soon after he's done this massive campaign to unify most of the ancient world. Um, and there's a big struggle out of that. Ptolemy uh, takes over Egypt, and initially they were very much trying to keep uh, a distance to themselves and those they, people they ruled. They found the Egyptians' need for gods and to proclaim a pharaoh, a god, uh, a rather awkward and strange idea, full of hubris, the thing that, that, that the Greeks were very sort of opposed to. Uh, but over the years, they found it harder and harder to rule over the Egyptians without kind of that kind of identity to promote. And so the Rosetta Stone is actually a document which puts forth um, in three different languages this idea that Ptolemy V, Epiphanes, is going to be worshipped like a deity. And this was this decree that was March, dated March 27th, 196 BCE. And it's in this time that um, this was created, and there was a number of these, these uh, stellas, these stones carved. And it was carved in three languages. It had to be in three languages. One was in the language of the gods, the hieroglyphs, or metonectyr. Next, it was written in the more common everyday language, Demotic. And then the last one, it was in, written in Greek. Now, this is very important because it was the Greeks who ruled over them. And in the Greek, it says, oh, and by the way, you know, we, we have written this in this one text in three different languages. Now, Greek was well known to people, and it was because it was written in these three languages that they were able to not only have the earliest access to uh, Coptic, but they were even eventually able to figure out um, the, the words and language behind the hieroglyphs. So if you look at this, the, 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 the stone was discovered after centuries of, of foreign rule when Napoleon's army captures Egypt. And it was a French soldier who discovered this um, stone at El Rashid which the English called uh, Rosetta. And that's why it gets its name is not from the French, but from the English capture of the, of the region. We'll talk a bit more about that. Let's look at the stone itself. You can see what's left um, is only a small portion of it. The vast majority of the upper part of the stone is missing, which was where the majority of the hieroglyphs were. But there was enough hieroglyphs there. There was almost all of the... Demotic there, and almost entirely the, the the bottom text in Greek. And so with that, it was able to be a, a very important tool for translation. Now, as soon as they discovered this stone, it was brought to the attention of the, the people, and, and Napoleon's had um, scientists with him who were studying these. They knew this was an extraordinary find. 
and they tried to hide it, but they also used the, the stone as a as a printing press. They there was the words were engraved into the stone. So they covered the stone with ink. And then they pressed paper over the stone and were able to make several copies of the stone, which they quickly secretly hid in a number of different couriers. And they sped out of Egypt with those because they knew the English were on their way and they were going to overthrow the French army. And eventually the French army surrendered to the British in 1801. And with that, the stone was eventually uncovered and brought to the British Museum, where it was stayed there for quite some time. Painted on the bottom of the stone are the words captured in Egypt by the British Army, 1801. And on the other end, presented by King George III to the British Museum. And it's still there. Um, and at the time, H. Turner, Major General, made this pr proclamation it's deposited in the British Museum, where I trust it will long remain a most valuable relic of antiquity, a proud trophy of the arms of Britain, not plundered by defenseless inhabitants, but honorably acquired by the fortune of war. So there he's sort of saying it was sort of underhanded of the French to take it from the natives. And they're sort of capturing it from the French is more noble in some way. Anyways, um, whatever their argument was, they've made no pains about keeping it and no interest in returning it to Egypt at all. And it was for a long time uh, a mystery about how to decipher this. Um, it, it was not immediately up, even though they had, they had, you know, the Greek text there. There was perceptions about the hieroglyphics that made it difficult for people to figure out how they actually worked. They thought the hieroglyphics was a picture language, like Chinese, where each picture had a kind of symbolic meaning. And to a certain extent, that was true, because that was sort of the perception the Greeks had of the language. But in fact, it was actually, again, a kind of alphabet. And by, and by deciphering the cartouches, these special little parts that were you know, featured in the language where names were written. You could tell that from a cartouche, this sort of little circular form that indicated this is a proper name, that was from figuring that out, they were able to start to understand the sounds of the language and begin to start to key the way in which it was directly related from the Greek and the Coptic into the hieroglyphic. And the man who did this was not English. It was actually a Frenchman, Champignon, in 1822. And he was greatly celebrated for his discovery. And it was very important you see this picture here. He's this guy in the center of the painting with his big red beard. Here he is, this great uh, heroic man who's brought uh, ancient Egypt into this you know, the, the idea of the ancient Egypt into the, the Western world. And it was a very important discovery, not just in a kind of scientific intellectual way, but it was also a kind of political symbolic gesture that kind of linked the world of Egypt to the world of France. It's like, why would they be so captivated by this world of ancient Egypt? And why was it so important to have translated this, that they would kind of battle the English for this and secret it away in the way they did. And it has largely to do with this concept of nation that the French and English had at this time, that there was a kind of continuity that they wanted to establish, a kind of prehistory that descended back through the centuries, and that by sort of owning this Egyptian heritage, by sort of claiming this Egyptian identity and this history as their own, they would somehow link their own nation to this undying, eternal Western civilization. That was really what it was all about, a kind of symbolic connection. And a lot of different cultures have done this. One is most common is this idea of, quote, Cleopatra's needle, which rests in France. Uh, there's also, these are obelisks that were abducted from 
different parts of Egypt. The one that you see here is actually from in Paris. This is a, an obelisk that actually comes from the New Kingdom. It has nothing to do with Cleopatra. It's much older than that. Um, and yet we, we sort of create this mythology. And of course, this, this idea that somehow conquering Egypt and bringing it into pe the heart of Paris is somehow creating that sort of mythic link to this ancient dynastic rule that goes back to the dawn of time. Okay. And I take this out because this is, you know, sort of the, the Western fantasy of Egypt and how Egypt has become sort of consumed into our own mythology of Western civilization to a much greater degree than any other part of Africa. Okay. And it's that disparate nature of this, that legacy that I want to talk about now. And that disparate nature was brought into focus once again in the modern age. We look at the Aswan Dam, okay, the Nile Water Agreement of Egypt and the Sudan of 1959, just as Egypt had kind of gained its independence after World War II, and they began to build on this vast new industrial, this new nation needed more cheap electric power. They wanted to control the flooding of the Nile, and they wanted to be able to harness this to create lots of energy for these new cities. So, but it meant building a dam that would create this vast lake and flood many of the ancient sites of Egypt. And so there was a very ambitious project to um, move whole temples and to do a kind of quick archaeological for all the areas that were going to be affected by this new dam. Unfortunately, there was a huge disparity in the effort that was made to the antiquities of Egypt and the antiquities of further up the Nile that were going to also be affected that were a part of Nubia. Nubia did not garner the same kind of uh, urgency. And in that case, while many of the, the elements were dismantled, relocated, and re-erected, many others were just identified and then the they were just buried under the water and lost to us forever. So that's part of the problem here in this uh, history is the unequal way in which we work to preserve and connect to the ancient history of Egypt and largely have uh, overlooked and ignored the history of Nubia. So here you can see in our view of modern Egypt, the place of the uh, just past the first cataract, the, the Nubian Dam is here, and they're, they're even building another dam further up. So in the end, time ran out because it was clear it would not be possible to document many of the sites of lower Nubia completely, and that much of the inundation which careful archaeological issue could reveal would be lost forever. Because like once it's underwater, you can't dig it up. You can't do it. New sediment and everything is just gone. And so how do we understand this disparate? Why was Egypt so important? Why was Nubia so much less so? And part of that is that we sort of adopted the attitude of the ancient kingdom of the Egyptians, that Nubians were somehow lesser people, uh, less worthy, and the Egyptians through their own iconography and hubris were the ones that sort of assigned themselves a more superior role. Part of it is that Egypt had a written language, Nubia did not. And then we had a kind of urgency to correct, connect to this ancient history that was connected to the Bible and many other important documents in the West. And so Egypt is and was a part of that idea, this way in which we value one piece of information and value another piece of information much less so. And so we had to talk about this. I wanted to introduce you to Edward Said, who wrote a very important book back in 1979, where he called Orientalism. And in it, he was talking about the way in which the West, the Orient, talks about the East. The Sorry, the West is the Occident, 
He talks about the East, the Orient. So what is the Orient? What is the Occident? What is the West? What is the East? How do we define these terms? What do they mean? Do they actually relate to anything in particular? And I think what Saeed pointed out was there was this sort of way in which we define the West as being in opposition to the East. And that there was this division that was made in our mind that somehow Egypt belonged in the world of the Occident, the West, and that it was important to sort of include it in our expanding pantheon of our own identity, and yet somehow then create this artificial barrier that kept Nubia and everything further to the south and also further to the east as somehow being more foreign, less worthy of our attention. And this is sort of this ethnic division that was really pretty arbitrary. And that Orientalism sort of draws out this idea that there are these sort of regions of the world that we privilege and there are parts of the world that we ignore. That there are parts where we, we, we denigrate to say that it's just different than us or opposite from us. And this is these sort of assertions, the way we self-identify. Because it's not really about the Orient. Ultimately, it's more about us and how we define ourselves than it is about the people who we think are not us. And this is a very important idea in Orientalism. He said, I, I begun with the assumption that the Orient is not an inert fact of nature. It is not merely there. Just as the Occident, the West, itself is not just there either. Right? There is no real place that these things are describing. What they're describing are ideas that people in one culture have for the other, and that they say it is a way of kind of defining themselves. And like, I think this is still important to us because, as he says, if it is true that no production of knowledge in the human sciences can ever ignore or disclaim its author's involvement as a human subject in its own circumstances, then it must also be true that for a European or an American studying the Orient, there can be no disclaiming the main circumstances of his actuality, that he comes up against the Orient as a European or an American first, and as an individual second. And to be a European and an American in such a situation is by no means an inert fact. So what does this mean? It means that I, a non-African, a American coming to study African art, this is a fact. It is a part of the knowledge, and I have to acknowledge that, that I am not a part of the culture that I am speaking about. And I don't pretend or, or profess to speak for them. I'm merely, from my perspective, doing the best I can to explain what I know, given the circumstances. Needless to say, this is something that we all have to be very aware of, is these prejudices that we might carry with us as we go forward. So now let's move on to the review quiz. To begin with, this covers all three of our lecture sections. How is Central Saharan rock art similar to early dynastic Egyptian art? How did art in the New Kingdom differ from the preceding dynasties? How is the relationship between Egypt and Nubia characterized in early dynastic art? Why was the Rosetta Stone important to understanding Egyptian dynastic history? Why were the archaeological fates of Egypt and Nubia so different?